The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. We are so lucky to have Tony Campolo with us today. He's a speaker. He's written over 30 books, which I find incredible. Um, I don't think I'll even come close to writing maybe a quarter of a book. Um, he's, an, he's been an advisor to presidents. Tony is an amazing man of God and a wonderful example of living in the now. This man is hilarious, compassionate, inspiring, and most importantly, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you guys join me in welcoming Tony Campbell? Thank you very much. Thank you. I was on a train leaving Victoria Station. We were about 10 minutes out of the train station, and uh, these two men sitting opposite me reacted. One had a seizure. I hadn't seen a seizure for years. I was kind of frightened. He shook. He rolled off the seat onto the floor. His friend quickly reacted, picked up the man and put him back on the seat, took off his coat, made it into a blanket, rolled up a newspaper, put it in his mouth so he wouldn't bite his tongue and administer some medicine. The man shook for about a minute. It seemed like longer than that, but it was frightening. And then he fell into a very, very deep sleep. His friend said, please forgive us. We were in Vietnam together. I was seriously wounded. I lost my leg. He pulled up his trousers, showed me an artificial leg. My friend here, a hand grenade tore away half of his chest. And there was shrapnel all through his chest. He couldn't move without screaming in pain. As we lay there, the helicopter that had been sent to rescue us was blown out of the air by a rocket. And I knew we were going to die. Somehow my friend stood up in agony. He stood up. He moved with pain and he reached down and grabbed my shirt. And he began to drag me through the jungle. Every step he took, he screamed in pain. I yelled at him, James, let me be. Go on without me. You'll never get both of us out of this jungle. But he did. I don't know how he did it, but he did. A year ago, I heard he had this condition. And I also heard that somebody has to be with him every minute of the day. Because we never know when these convulsions will occur. And somebody has to be there to take care of him at that moment. So I closed down my apartment in New York and sold my car. And I came over. And I'm that somebody. I'm with him every minute of the day. So that's our story. I, I hope you'll excuse the upset. I said, you don't have to apologize to me, mister. I'm a speaker. And whenever I can come up with a really good story, I'm thrilled. This is a great story. I'll not forget his response. He said, oh, don't be overly impressed. Uh, you see, mister, after what he did for me, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for him. Gratitude. We owe that kind of gratitude to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for what he did for us and what he continues to do for us every minute of every day. 2,000 years ago, when he died on the cross, he took the punishment for our sins, but more than that, he absorbed the sin itself. He absorbed the sin itself. Let me take you on a brief excursion into Einstein's theory of relativity. I thought that would get you. <laughs> Einstein said that time is relative to motion. The faster you travel, the more time is compressed. So if I put you in a rocket and sent you into outer space, traveling at 160,000 miles a second, and said, come back in 10 years, when you return, you would be 10 years older, but all the rest of us would be 20 years older. You say, how's that? 
because as you increase speed, time becomes compressed, more and more compressed. So at 160,000 miles a second, our 20 years would be compressed into 10 years of your time. If I put you in a rocket and send you into space and you were traveling at 170,000 miles a second, our 20 years would be compressed into one day of your time. Now here's the clincher. If I got you traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, all of time would be compressed into one moment. Now we can't do that because as you approach the speed of light, your physical body would expand outward in weight and size towards infinity. I tell you that because don't let anybody ever say you're fat. Just say, I'm traveling too fast. You just tell them. <laughs> but if I could get you traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, all of time would be compressed into one eternal now. All of time would be compressed into one eternal moment. There would be no passage of time at all. No passage of time at all. I tell you that because that's God time. With God, there is no past, there is no future. The very name of God suggests his eternal nowness. The name of God is what? I am that I am. God never was, God never will be. God is in an eternal now for him. All of time, all of history is compressed into one moment. That's why Jesus, it could be said, I am the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. It all is one moment with me. He said before Abraham was, I am. He wasn't using poor grammar. He was saying something profound. He said before Abraham was, thousands of years ago, that's simultaneous with me right now. It's present tense with me right now. Before Abraham was, I am. The nowness of God. You say, so why is this so important? Because when Jesus hung on the cross 2,000 years ago, he was and he is simultaneous with you sitting right here in this church. You say, wait a minute, Campolo. There's 2,000 years separating me here and Jesus on the cross back there. But at the speed of light, in God time, those two moments are compressed into the same moment. So as Jesus hangs on Calvary's cross, he has you on his mind. He is aware of you sitting here and now. In his divinity, he is able to do that. And it says in Scripture, he not only takes the punishment for our sins, but this, he takes the sin itself. The scripture says, he who knew no sin, he who never sinned, who despised sin, loathed sin, on the cross it says, he became sin. If you were Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, you would know this line from the liturgy. On the cross he became everything, everything that we are, in order that we might become everything that he is. Whoa. Whoa, you say, what does that mean? It means that on judgment day, you need not be concerned. It says in the book of Jude, he will present you faultless, spotless, sinless to the Father. Is that incredible? He has absorbed all of that into his own body. When you sin, he reaches across time and space and connects with you and empathetically absorbs into himself all of those dark and ugly things things about you. And on judgment day, he shall present you to the Father, here it comes, faultless, faultless. I can hardly wait. Father, I'd like you to meet my friend Tony, the perfect one. <laughs> I hope my wife's there. I can just hear you say, well, you don't know him like I know him. You know? <laughs> the good news of the gospel is, that your sin is absorbed on Calvary. He reaches across time and space and like a magnet, he draws out of you all those dark and ugly things that are part of who you are. Every, like a sponge, he absorbs all the ugly sinfulness of your life and makes it his own. He who knew no sin, says the scripture on the cross, listen to this, he doesn't just take the punishment, he becomes sin. That's incredible. And yet... It happens, and it happens every moment of the day. And right now, 
If you'll simply open yourself up and say, Jesus, connect with me. Reach across time and space and touch me and absorb out of me those things in me that ought not to be so that I can become everything that you want me to be. Cleanse me, O oh God. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me, cleanse me, purify me. We've got a God that not only forgives, but cleanses. Who not only forgives sin, but becomes sin for our sake. How do you say thank you to such a gift? How do you, how do you say thankful? How, how do you do that? Well, there's an infinite ways in which you can respond. Let me just say three simple ones. He wants you to become empathetic like he was empathetic. He empathized with people. He knew what was in people. He felt people's pain. He felt people's hurts. He always was willing to be interrupted. Like he was interrupted by blind Bartimaeus. You need help? Let me stop. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me empathize with you. Let me connect with you. Empathy. There's a difference between looking at a person and looking into a person. I tell my students at Eastern University where I teach that there is a difference. They don't get it because they're too young. But when the Holy Spirit explodes inside of you, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are empowered to do something. You are empowered to not only look at a person, but to look into a person's eyes and reach down into the depths of a person's being and connect. Connect with the innermost recesses of that person's being. The person is no longer just another human being. When you reach into a person's soul, you sense the holiness. Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, theologian said, it becomes an I-thou relationship. For to connect with the other person like that is to touch God himself. To connect with God himself. What a what an incredible story. What an incredible gift. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands everything that we are. Gratitude to God for his great gift in Jesus Christ. Empathy. The second thing is concern. To be concerned. I don't care whether you're a conservative or a liberal politically. Every Christian should be concerned about those pathetic people marching up towards the border. I mean, I'm not asking for a political solution because I don't have one. Every time I listen to politicians, they always give me an answer, and every answer I can see things that are wrong with the answer. But there has to be an answer. And if this is true about Jesus, it's true about you. He's concerned. You know he's concerned. And as you go to bed at night, do you reach out to them? Do you try to connect with them and pray for them in the midst of the hurt and the agony that they must be experiencing? To be concerned with these people, we do not brush them off. We do not say, well, they shouldn't be doing this. You just know that they are hurting people and we must be concerned about them. Do you do what you can do? You can all name some lonely person that doesn't get visited. True religion is this, says the book of James, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. There's some sick person. There's somebody who, who, whose day would change if you gave them a phone call. If you wrote a card to them when you're on vacation, if you remember their birthday, I mean, to be concerned. It's one way of showing your gratitude to God to be concerned about other people. And then this, to be committed. To be committed. I mean, it's one thing to believe in Jesus. I mean, I meet them all the time. I ask students, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Big deal. You can go down to the local bar and ask the guy on the stool next to you, do you believe in Jesus? Chances are I'll say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. It's not believing, it's being committed. 
There's a big difference between being a believer and being a disciple. And Jesus said, go into all the world and make what? Believers out of everybody? Go into all the world and make disciples. Disciples are people who do what the master would do at any given moment. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do what Jesus would do if Jesus was in your place? Are you willing to become the person that Jesus wants you to become? One of my students said, I have thought about becoming a minister, but doctor, you have no idea how much sin there is in my life. I'm so unworthy. I, I, just, I just can't do it because of my unworthiness. I told him a story about sending a student over to be with Bishop Tutu, who said exactly the same thing to Bishop Tutu in Africa. I'm not worthy to be called a, become a minister or a missionary. And Bishop Tutu said, don't worry, Harry, don't worry. God has very low standards. <laughs> Do you understand what I just said? God has low standards. So don't say, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy. Come just as you are, and Jesus will transform you. But you've got to be committed. You've got to say, Jesus, here's my life. Let it be holy, yielded, Lord, to thee. To be committed. To be committed. I have a, had a friend, Dale Moody. He taught at the seminary in, south, in the South. He talks about the day his mother died. And he said she rolled off the chair onto the floor right after breakfast. My father ran around to the other side of the table, picked her up, and carried her out to the pickup truck, plunked her in the front seat, was down the road into the, onto the highway. She was dead on the arrival at the hospital. The day of the funeral, we went out and we put her into the ground. We checked everything out and then went back to the homestead. We were sitting on the back porch when my father asked me and my brother, who was there with us, what do you suppose mom is doing right now? What do you suppose she's doing this very moment? And Dale said, I told my father when she closed her eyes, the next moment she opened them, the first thing she saw was the face of Jesus. And my father said, oh, oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, when by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, glory for me. Now let's go back to the cemetery. They said, it's 1030 at night. Don't argue with a man who's just buried his wife of 54 years. And they went back to the cemetery and he checked out everything. Checked out everything. Made sure the flowers and everything was in place. And then he stood back and he took one son in one arm and one son in the other arm. And he held them close. And he said, we can go home now. We can go home now. Boys, it's been a good day. It was a good 54 years and it ended just the way I wanted it to end. She went first. When two people are committed like the two of us have been committed, each wants the other one to go first because I didn't want her to have to go through the pain that I'm going through, putting her in the grave. Do you understand, boys? We were committed. We were committed. We can go home now. It's been a good day. It's been a very, very good day. People, people, there's very little commitment in this world, is there? Marriages fall apart because of lack of commitment. People fall apart because they don't understand commitment. And I'm calling you not only to believe in Jesus, but to become committed to Jesus, not just to believe the doctrines of the Apostles' Creed, but to say, here's my life. I want to commit myself to you. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. To be committed. To be committed. 
You've been a lovely congregation. I wondered what you would be like, but you've been lovely. Considering that you're overwhelmingly white. <laughs> white people are hard to talk to. They really are. I mean, you could say anything to a white congregation. I just returned from the moon. I belong to an African-American church, a black church, and man, they let you know how you're doing. The deacons sit right up front, right up front. And whenever you say something good, the deacons yell, preach, brother, preach! I would have done much better had my deacons been here instead of you people. And the women in my church, they put one hand in the air like this and they go, well, just like that, well. Doesn't sound like much. You got 500 women going, well. And the men in my church, they're the best. They're up on their feet and they're yelling, keep going, baby, keep going, man, keep going, keep going. You don't get that from white people. <laughs> white people do not yell, keep going. They yell, stop, stop. <laughs> Once a year in our church, uh, we have student recognition day. And the students come back from the colleges and universities, come to the pulpit one by one, give the name, Tell what they're doing, what they're studying, and the old people love it. I'm studying law at Harvard. People go, my, my. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Somebody else will say, I'm studying engineering at MIT. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Somebody else will say, I, I'm, studying, I'm studying music at Juilliard. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You heard great music today, but you haven't heard the greatest music. So you hear about 500 grandmothers and grandfathers moaning and groaning, the moans and groans of joy because their grandchildren are becoming what America never let them be. You know what I mean by that, don't you? And when they were all finished and seated, bright eyed and bushy tailed, my pastor got up and looked at him. He said, children, children, you're gonna die. You are gonna die. That's a good thing to tell young people because they don't think they're going to die. That's why they drive the way they do. <laughs> You're going to die. They're going to take you out to the cemetery. They're going to drop you in a hole. They're going to throw dirt in your face, and they're going to go back to the church and eat potato salad. <laughs> when you were born, you were the only one that cried. Everybody else was happy. That's not important. Here's what's important. When you die, will you be the only one that's happy? And everybody else will cry. That depends on what you're living for, titles or testimony. That's black preaching. It's got alliteration and power. Titles or testimonies. Then he did what only a black preacher can do. He swept through the Bible in five minutes. He said there was Moses and there was Pharaoh. Pharaoh had the title, ruler of Egypt. That's a good title, ruler of Egypt. But when it was over, that's all he had was a title. He had the title, but Moses had the testimonies. testimonies. Yeah, you got it. He said there was Jezebel, Queen Jezebel. That's another good title, Queen. Queen Jezebel. She was going to destroy Elijah, the prophet of God, but when it was over, all she had was a title. She had the title. He had the testimonies. And then there's... Then there's Daniel and, and Darius the king threw him into the lion's den. I mean, uh, Darius had a title, king, King Darius. But when it was over, all he had was a title. He had the title, but Daniel had the Excellent. people of God. One of these days, they will drop you in a hole. They'll throw dirt in your face and they'll go back to the church and eat potato salad. What will it amount to? A tombstone and an obituary with some titles? Or will there be people standing around your grave giving testimonies of how you empathized, how you were concerned, how in the name of Jesus you were committed to their well-being? Hear me, people. I wish for you both titles and testimonies, but if you have to make a choice, Go for the testimonies. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Bobby Schuler. Thank you for joining us in this brand new 2019. I'm so excited about this coming year. Up front in this new year, I wanna make a strong and faith-filled declaration over you. You can live a worry-free life. I realize that may sound like a pipe dream with everything going on in our world today, along with what can unexpectedly happen in our lives. But here's the truth. Right now, right where you are, no matter what the circumstances are around you look like, you can win the worry war against worry, fear, and anxiety, and experience God's incredible peace. We're not trying to say worry will never arise in your life. Stuff happens, and we are human. Believe me, I have more than enough opportunities to worry on a regular basis. But in those moments and situations when worry will try to defeat us, I want you to know that God has given you everything you need to stand in faith, strength, and victory. He's going to give you what you need to win the war against worry. Yeah, we're committed to giving you the necessary tools to help overcome worry in your life because as Hannah said, we want you to win the worry war. I promise you that overcoming worry and experiencing authentic God-given peace is possible. So I want to encourage you to take a step today and request the amazing resources we've put together for you. As a thank you for your support, Bobby and Hannah are pleased to offer you the brand new Winning the Worry War 4 CD audio set. The dynamic and practical messages in this series will give you the tools you need to successfully surrender your worry and anxiety to God especially as you start the new year. Along with this series, we'll include the special Overcoming Worry Promise Card Set. These five by seven cards were created to help you overcome worry in your finances, relationships, health, decisions, allowing you to trust in the knowledge that God has an amazing plan for your future. Call, write, or go online today and request the CD series and promise cards. We're asking for a gift of any size. Or with your generous gift of $100 or more, in addition to the audio series and promise cards, you'll also receive our 12 by 12 Anxious for Nothing framed art piece. With your special gift of $250 or more, in addition to the other wonderful resources, you'll also receive a stunning leather NIV thin line Bible. This Bible comes as a special large print edition and the easy to read and understand translation will help you or those close to you discover the power of God's word in a brand new way. Call, write, or go online today. And for your generous gift of any size, we'll send you Winning the Worry War 4 CD audio series and the Overcoming Worry promise card set. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.